Hey everyone and welcome to Back to Business. I'm Sarah Pateo, your host. On today's episode, we will be sitting down with Mendy Inglis from Fidelity. Mendy, how are you doing today? Good morning. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Good to be here. Wonderful. So happy to have you. How, uh, how has everything been going with uh, the start of summer and living in Brooklyn? Uh, Brooklyn's hot place to live. Uh, most people are actually moving out to Florida these days. But I enjoy Brooklyn. I like living in New York. Good. I'm happy to hear that. There's a uh, lot to do, a lot to see. Uh, a lot of great people watching, I'm sure, always. Yes. Yeah, so I will tell you, New York is slowly coming out of COVID and businesses are getting back to work. Um, we don't have the lockdowns that we had this time last year. It was a very different world, not just in New York, but everywhere. And it's oh, good to see yeah. businesses uh, really back to work. Yes, I'm, I'm thrilled to see that and happy to see people reentering the workforce and hopefully the businesses bounce back that were more damaged than others during the last year, year and some change. Um, but I'm, I'm really happy to hear that New York's bouncing back. I think moving to Florida, you know, that's, that's good for some, but the seasons are great and uh, I would stay put, but that's just me. So tell me a little bit about your background. I know that you, you know, you work for Fidelity or in credit card processing services right now, but I'm curious where you started, how you got there. So just a brief overview. A brief overview? Well, I'm from England originally. I, my first real work was actually in Israel uh, dealing drugs. I uh, worked, I oh. see your face when I said that. I worked at a pharmaceutical company. I did that for a couple of years, moved out to New York for work, was in real estate, and then ventured into Fidelity Payment Services, where I've been for the last about 15 years. Okay, wonderful. So it was legal drugs that you were dealing. That's correct. <clears throat> See, I told you I wouldn't throw you any curveballs, but you're throwing me some curveballs. So, so awesome. I, Sorry about that, but it's okay. No, that's okay. That's part of your story. Um, so you lived in England till you were how old? Uh, I think about 18. 18. Okay. So you had all of your childhood, all of your teen years there. Yes. Was it difficult to move to the States? Was it something that you were dreading or was it like a very exciting time for you and, and your family? Oh, well, this was uh, about 20 years ago. Um, no, it was exciting. I had, I had, a, still have a lot of friends in the United States my family is still in England, but I, I love it here, and it was exciting to move, and uh, it's good to be here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, good. I'm happy to hear that. How did you enter the credit card processing world? So it sounds like you have a bit of a diverse background in terms of the work that you've done from, real est from drug dealing to real estate to credit card <laughs> yeah. processing. So tell me, I guess, maybe what intrigued you about the industry. Maybe there was a big break in there at some point, just... A very interesting down. question what got me in, and I'll, I'll give you the honest answer. I ran a title insurance company. I'm not sure if you're familiar with what title insurance is, but I think most of your viewers probably are. Anyone who's bought a yes. house knows yes. what it is. And I ran a title insurance company. This was just before the real estate crash. Our clients were real estate attorneys and mortgage brokers who would refer us business. And there was a mortgage broker who was a good friend of mine, and his business was slowly going under as the real estate crash started to happen. And he got involved with Fidelity Payment Services. And he called me up one day and he said, I'm short of money. They've got a promo that if you bring somebody in who can sign up 10 new merchants within about a month, I think it was, I get a two grand bonus. I could really use your help. And he was a friend of mine. I could see his business was struggling. And I said, no problem. And I did it for him. And I got in the 10 accounts and, and that was it. Uh, the real estate market crashed. The bank that we were owned by collapsed and uh, went out of business. Over 400 people lost their jobs back then. But funnily enough, I was getting residual payments from those 10 accounts that I bought in as a favor for my friend. And I was getting calls from some of those merchants and that's how I really got into it. It started out as a favor to a friend, which worked out very, very well for me. And that's the strange story of how it came about. That is wonderful. I love that story. I think it's interesting because he needed your help. 
but it sounds like things weren't great with the bank and the, the, the insurance that you were doing at the time and with, you know, the change in the housing industry, it was a good time for you to leave too. So yes, maybe you needed him a little bit too. I don't know. It worked out. It definitely worked out. That's for sure. I've always been told the more you give, the more you get. So you gave to him in a way that I'm sure most friends wouldn't make that sacrifice. And it sounds like you got a great career out of it. There's definitely truth in that. You, you never lose out by helping somebody. Never. That's yes. wonderful. And does Fidelity still offer that sort of referral program? Like if you No, like, no. This it. was 15 years ago. They were definitely one of the fastest growing um, credit card processing companies in the United States back then. The owner back then, the principal, was a, was a good friend of mine. Um, he was growing his team. Now we're definitely within the top three in the United States in terms of volume of credit card processing of billions and billions of dollars annually. Um, so no, we don't offer those promos anymore. We're pretty selective about who comes on board. I bet. Yeah, I've, I've heard of other industries offering those sorts of, you know, $1,000 for a referral. $2,000 is not, not too shabby. That's, that's quite nice. Yeah, he got the money and it worked out very well for me. Yeah, excellent. And I'm sure you maybe brought in some people along the way and uh, benefited from the referral program at the time and maybe not, but. Um, I have brought in some people, but we never had the same referral program as, as we had back then. Um, we're a big company, but it's, it's uh, very tight knit. Um, our principals are actually a large Wall Street hedge fund, but they leave us alone. And well, uh, they're proud of what we do. And uh, we're proud of what we do. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot to be proud of. Yes. So I know you said you've been in the industry for about 15 years. So you've seen, I'm sure, a lot of changes outside of just the referral program and the growth in the industry and ranking, you know, number three across the U.S. with uh, credit card processing companies. But what are some things that stick out to you in terms of changes, whether it be rates or the types of clients that you're seeing or anything along those lines? There's definitely been significant changes over the past 10 or 15 years. Um, rates I'll get to in a second, but just the credit card industry in general. Um, 15 years ago, the percentage of a merchant's business, his financial volume, which came about through credit card processing is way, way higher than it was a decade ago. And I will tell you, especially over the past year with COVID, merchants are finding that up to 90 or 95% of their revenue now comes from credit cards versus 10 or 15 years ago may have been as low as 50 or 60%. Wow. Uh, consumers are using them more and the merchants are finding they can't avoid it. It used to be that merchants could get away without accepting credit cards. That's definitely uh, no longer the case. So just in terms of the growth of the industry as a whole, that's uh, tremendous growth that's happening. And the types of cards have changed tremendously. So what we're finding now is, is that the banks, the issuing banks, you know, you may have a Chase credit card, you may have a Citibank credit card, the type of cards have changed as well in that they're offering their customers uh, tremendous incentives, whether it's with miles, points, or straight up 2% cashback is now one of the most popular types of cards. And that incentivizes the consumer to use their credit cards, but it drastically changes the, what the merchant has to pay for accepting credit cards. So yes, moving on to rates, the rates have grown. You know, if the bank is giving a customer, call it 2% cashback or two miles per dollar, that has to be paid for. And it's the merchants, the businesses that are paying for that. So the cost of accepting credit cards, what's known as the interchange rate, which varies by card type, that has grown uh, tremendously and it will continue to grow. It's, I will tell you something interesting. We now have offices in Canada. We have offices in England. I brought my brother in actually as a partner in Fidelity in the UK a few years ago. In Europe and in England in particular, they regulated the fees in the credit card processing industry. So the cost to merchants abroad are far less than to US consumers. But on the flip side, the banks cannot give the same type of rewards to customers that U.S. banks give over here. 
because it has to be paid for and it's not being paid for. So what I would venture to suggest in the US is one of two things have to happen. Either the government here will regulate the credit card industry fees, which is not regulated right now. And basically they charge what they can get away with, meaning how much they're offering the customer back. So let's say a credit card would have come out tomorrow giving 3% cash back, then the merchant is going to be charged 3.5% for paying for that. And there's potential for growth, which is actually damaging to businesses because it's a huge bite out of their bottom line. Or if the government cracks down and regulates the fees, it will help merchants because their costs are going to be lower, but it will hurt consumers because they won't be subject to the same rewards and in some cases, tax-free rewards that they're getting right now. So right. there's a lot of potential for change in the future. Got it. Interesting. I um, I didn't realize that it operated like that in other places. And I didn't realize that that was something that could easily come to fruition here. And it sounds like a bit of a catch-22. Either you're hurting the consumer, you're hurting the business, but it's not like everybody is coming out very happy in the end necessarily. I don't know if hurting is the right way. It, it's just that they'd have to change their business model. Um, right. And there is changes coming about in terms of that. A lot of industries are now passing on the credit card processing fee onto the customer. So right. I you have do that see that even in local, some local stores. Um, it was originally common by gas stations. They were the number one industry to do it. You'd have a different price for cash or credit card. Mm -hmm. And the reason they did that was they were basically passing on the processing fee onto the consumer. And that's becoming more and more popular in different industries now. And I'm not sure what type of businesses your, your viewers have, but each industry needs somebody to, so to speak, jump in the hot water. You know, I was dealing with a, a large distributor of appliances who is very concerned about the tens of thousands of dollars he's spending every month on processing fees and he'd like to pass that on to the consumer but he can't he's nervous to be the first person in his industry to do it because if his competitors don't jump on board and do the same thing then he'll lose business so it's a tough jump to make but it's definitely advisable if a merchant if a business can get away with passing the fee on to the consumer it'll help their bottom line not just by the three percent in fees that they're paying but it can be up to 10% of their, of their net profit margin by passing their fee on to the consumer. Right, right. And I'm sure utilities, I mean, I don't send checks out often. I think most people pay their bills online with a credit card. It used to be much more check heavy, um, but someone has to be first with that. I mean, they can't be eating up all of those fees and charges and just absorbing it because when you're dealing with that type of volume, you know, it's different for a restaurant. Their volume isn't nearly that high for the most part, you know, small mom and pop shops and things like that. But yeah, for the DTEs of the world, I'm sure it's it's astronomical, the fees that they're paying. That's right. That's yeah. Right. But there will be some changes in the future. And uh, it'll be very interesting to see if um, the government follows suit with what's happening in Europe and tries to regulate cap basically the fees that the banks can charge for um, issuing their credit cards yeah yeah I'll, I'll definitely be following that now now that i i'm i feel like i have the insider scoop you know this is, you this definitely is do. for me and for all the other listeners and viewers um so i i have a ton of questions that i want to ask what you, everything oh. that you just said sparked a lot of different thoughts in my mind we'll keep this somewhat brief but one thing in particular, and this might be completely silly, but with Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies emerging, I know they've taken a dip recently, but is that something that's come up in your industry that is a concern at all? I know that it's probably pretty far off when people will be using that primarily. As a very, a uh, so it's a very, very interesting question. I think the reaction from the credit card processing industry is probably the same reaction that majority of people have towards cryptocurrencies, which is they don't take it seriously. When I say they don't take it seriously, they take it seriously as an investment. They mm -hmm. take it seriously in terms of what it accomplishes, but they don't take it seriously, meaning 
that it will become a mainstream form of payment. I don't believe that the majority of both individuals and businesses seriously think that it will become a mainstream form of payment. And whether it will or we won't, or it won't, I don't believe anyone knows the real answer to that question. So it's definitely not a concern that Bitcoin will detract from or replace even credit cards. Um, whether it will or it won't, I don't believe anybody knows the answer to that question. And it's definitely not a matter of concern right now for our industry. Okay, good. I was, I just figured, I mean, it's, it's something that I think a lot of people might be interested in hearing about, but yeah, I, I think if it did have any sort of impact on the industry, it would be many, many years before that happened. I think it has a place for some people. I think it's important for some people, but I can't imagine it making credit cards obsolete. Anytime. No, I, I would, we, you know, we, we have very, very strong relationships with our clients and uh, we're intimately involved with all aspects of their business. And if a merchant were to ask me what I think about them accepting Bitcoin, and I would tell them it's, it's a great marketing tool. It mm -hmm. creates a buzz. Okay, this business, you can now pay with Bitcoin. I, I wouldn't look at it as a serious form of uh, payment. But in terms of marketing, I think that's a, a brilliant way of going about creating um, a good presence and buzz for that business. And that's the way I think uh, merchants could maybe look at it. Oh, yeah, you get your name out there. I think it was PayPal most recently who came out and said, we accept Bitcoin. And it's, you know, now pay PayPal's on the tip of everyone's tongue. They want to talk about it. And then... Right. They get their five minutes of fame and we talk about something else. But I mean, I think, I think it was just yesterday when Tesla said they'd reconsider going back with Bitcoin and it shot, it shot the price up. Oh, it's, my goodness. It's good marketing for them. Elon needs to make up his mind on that matter. <laughs> uh, next time I see him, I'll let him know you said please, that. Please do. I would appreciate it. That would be really helpful, at least for my portfolio. Um, yeah. All right. I have a few more questions for you, but I don't want to make this too lengthy. I guess um, when when you started, where were rates at, if you remember, or roundabout, where are they at now and where do you see them going? I know that we talked about maybe the government regulating, but just, just to give us some numbers to think about. So you mentioned PayPal. So PayPal Square, um, Stripe to some extent, have a very large volume online presence dealing with relatively smaller merchants and they have flat rate fees. So 10 years ago, they were at 2.5%. If you want to open a, accept credit cards for, we call it keyed in, you know, for merchants that aren't physically swiping a credit card and they try to open an account with PayPal or Square, they're looking at 3.4% or even 3.6%. So it's a full 1% higher than it was 10 years ago. That's for sure. The actual cost has gone up, I would say, on average, a full 1% which is huge for a merchant. I'll give you a quick numbers example, depending if your listeners be interested. But I had a conversation with a pharmacy, small pharmacy, not so long ago. He, he purchases um, not prescription drugs, but over-the-counter painkillers, something like Advil. Without going into details, but let's, just, let's say his, his profit margin is about 10%. So if he's taking $5 for the sale of one box of Advil, he's going to make about 50 cents profit on that box of Advil. Now on a $5 transaction, if the customer pays by credit card and assuming he's paying a 20 cents transaction fee plus another 2%. So on the $5 transaction, he's going to be paying, uh, give me one second, 10% is 50, 1% is going to be five. He's going to be paying about five dollars 10 is 50 one is five two is 10 he's going to be paying 10 cents on the processing fee and he's going to be paying another 20 cents on the transaction fee that's 40 cents okay now we said his net profit was 10 percent on the five dollars which was 50 cents he just paid out 40 cents for taking the credit card that means that 80 percent of his net profit on that transaction went on the credit card fee. And a lot of merchants, they don't, even really 
smart and successful businesses, they don't actually realize the effective cost of accepting credit cards. So although they may think they're arguing over the 2% or 3%, but they often forget to factor in what it's doing to their net profit margin. Right. No, that was a great example to really help understand. And we all, we all do that at some point. You go make a very small purchase, you swipe your credit card and the profits for that business on what they're selling go way, way, way down. Right. And now you'll understand why you'll sometimes see by some businesses, we don't accept credit cards for under $10 or under $20, because that's the reason why they're not making a profit if they take a card for that amount. Right, right. They're, they're then losing money. Yeah, it makes it makes a lot of sense. The gas stations doing that. It all makes a lot of sense. I've had it happen in hair salons before. If you pay by credit card, you pay more. If you pay with cash, you pay what the list price well, is. Well, they may just oh. want the cash, but we won't talk about that. They hey, you know what? That's their business. <laughs> we'll let them uh we'll let them deal with that. So again, I have more questions, but I think this uh we might have to bring you on for a part two because I there's a lot of other questions I think that viewers and listeners would be interested in hearing. Um, And uh, there's definitely, there's definitely important information for all of your businesses to be aware of now in the industry. And I'll just shoot through a few highlights. Security is a big deal these days. Um, A lot of major retailers have been hacked and merchants need to be aware now more than ever protecting the security of their financial data. Chargebacks in our industry is growing tremendously. Um, There's ways of dealing with it. And, um, Call me if you're a merchant, you need help uh, with credit card processing. We have a lot of products that can help you. Great plug. I love that. Many uh, shameless, shameless plug. Yes. Shameless plug. You you have to do that. If you're not marketing for yourself, who is? Exactly. And I would expect all of our clients to act in the same way. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so, so much for your time. We'll definitely bring you you on for a part two to this podcast. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. You too. See you when you next come to New York. (laughs) Definitely.